Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you are speaking to us. We thank you because the work is started already in our hearts. You're already challenging us and stirring us up and renewing and reviving us. And we pray, Lord, that this work you have started within us, you will continue in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, that your purpose of bringing us to this workers' retreat will be fulfilled in every life in Jesus' name. We are praying that everything you want to tell us, everything you want to do within us, every challenge you want to throw at us, anything that you know we need, Lord, we pray you will do everything for us this time in Jesus' name. There is no limit to what you can do in a single day. You can turn a life around. You can bring an unforgettable encounter and challenge in a single day. In a single day with our God, we can climb the highest mountain. In a single day with our God, we can defeat the greatest enemy. In a single day in our life, you can fill our soul, our heart with heaven so that we'll never remain the same again. In a single day, you can so bring us to the Mount of Transfiguration and change us within and change us without. Energize us within and prepare us ready for any battle that may come across our way. In a single day, you can change our level of faith. You can change us from weakness to strength. You can change us from timidity to being bold in the spirit. You can change us from people that have been fearful and withdrawing from the battle to a conqueror and a warrior. You can change us in a single moment. And this is why we come, not counting this time to be a small, short period of time, believing that this short period of time will become a time of transformation, a time of change. Father, we pray for every brother here, we pray for every sister here, that you fill every soul with heaven. That, Lord, for the people that have been weak, for the people that have been uh, weary, for the people that are tired, for the people that are discouraged, oh, Lord, we pray, you will pour heaven down upon their spirit and soul in Jesus' name. For the people that are thinking that uh, they are defeated by the devil, or that they cannot overcome, or that this battle is so much for them, and maybe they are thinking of just giving up to the devil, and saying, well, whatever will be, will be. Oh Lord, we pray that this very day, you will wake them up. You will fill them with your power. Anoint them with your spirit, that they will never be the same again in Jesus' name. For those who have had attacks from the devil, and they have been thinking, well, I will never be free. This is my cross, and this is my yoke, and this is my lot. Uh, other people are free, but I cannot be free. I, I want to do a lot for God, but the hindrances are so many. Oh Lord, I pray that today you will break everything. Every shackle in their life you will destroy. And you will set them free, whatever cage the devil has placed them in. Oh Lord, I pray that you open that cage and let them get out and become free and have dominion in their lives in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that in this spiritual battle that anyone may be going through, that ours will be the victory. That your people will know and remember that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And with that knowledge and faith and confidence, will be able to arise and do what you have called us to do. In those days of old, your people were always overcome. And as you were, so are you today, because you are God, you change now. You have told us of Jesus Christ, you said yesterday and forever. And today, yesterday and forever, we know that His power will be alive and active in us. Therefore, Lord, we pray that every yoke, every bondage, every kind of limitation, any kind of oppression, any kind of sin that is keeping your people away from the victory they ought to have. They will overcome from this very moment in Jesus' name. They will be free, they will be free indeed. Free to fight in the battle of the law. Free to do exploits for the law. Free to conquer the enemy. Free to rescue souls from bondage and captivity. That the glory will belong to you. And the blessing will be long to your people and to all your servants. We thank you because we know you have answered. We we'll definitely see the manifestation in our lives. 
In Jesus' name we pray. In Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, we are reading from verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against the ritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And I mean done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and working thereunto, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. What we are looking at now is spiritual warfare for souls. That is, spiritual warfare for the sake of souls in captivity. Spiritual warfare on behalf of souls in captivity who cannot deliver themselves. Spiritual warfare on behalf of souls who are held in bondage, who do not know the freedom that Christ has brought. And we proclaim it to them, but even though they want to be free, there is not that power in them to so become free and so they need the help of warriors of the Lord, the help of helpers in the faith, the help of those who know how to fight and wage war against what is holding them captive so that they can be delivered. Spiritual warfare is fighting battle in the spiritual realm to rescue souls from captivity warfare fighting wrestling in a spiritual way are engaged in by these spiritual warriors so that they can save souls and this warfare we are talking about is not leisure activity the warfare we are talking about is not playing or spiritual entertainment. Spiritual warfare is the conflict of two worlds. Conflict between light and darkness. Conflict between good and evil. Conflict between the supernatural coming from the Holy Ghost and the pseudo-supernatural coming from the devil. Spiritual warfare then is that conflict between these two powers waging war to keep souls down in darkness, in sin, in evil, in captivity and eventually the part that wins that battle wins the soul into a kind of kingdom if you win in that spiritual warfare for souls then you rescue souls from the kingdom of darkness and you bring them into the kingdom of the only begotten Son of God. If you don't fight, or if you fight and you lose, 
then the evil sacred in captivity, in sin, in evil, in suffering, in misery. Moses engaged in such a warfare with Pharaoh, with the magicians, with the gods of Egypt, to bring Israel out of Egypt. Israel would never have come out of Egypt without that spiritual warfare. Daniel's warfare against the spiritual prince of Persia was no less intense. And you see of Paul's description in the passage we just read together now of wrestling in spiritual warfare. And that description is so vivid and challenging. Why? We have to wrestle. Can some of us choose to avoid wrestling, fighting, avoid spiritual warfare altogether, and then choose to be involved in things that do not demand sweat and tears and conflict and agonizing confrontation? Is it not possible for us to just say, well, the choice of ministry I'm going to have has nothing to do with spiritual warfare? I choose this area, I choose this area, I choose that area, and I will never come into conflict with the devil, with the enemy, with the enemy of souls trying to keep them in bondage and captivity. Satan and his organized demons will not excuse you from the battle. If you refuse to fight, they are still going to fight you. If you refuse to wage war against them, they are still going to wage war against the souls of people you are trying to win. Therefore, you have no choice. He wants to fight to stop your onward journey to heaven. And you better get ready to fight in that spiritual warfare because if you don't fight, they're going to succeed in stopping your way in wanting to make heaven in 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. The sober, the vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom receives set fast in the faith. If he wouldn't fight you, if he would leave you alone once to say, no, I don't want to get involved in that, I want to have a peaceful ministry that has no warfare, no conflict, no battle, no wrestling, no fighting involved in it. If that were possible, the word of God would not have told everybody who receives set fast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. That is even those sinners who know nothing about spiritual warfare. The devil is still waging war with them. And you better understand that if you are going to win in this battle, you need to put on the whole armor of God so that you will be able to win. Moreover, you cannot rescue a single soul without praying. You cannot rescue a single soul without active faith. Not quiet faith, silent faith, passive faith. That's not going to make it every time. Active faith, fighting the holy war for spiritual weapons. You see, as you look at souls that we have to rescue, as you look at the souls that God has called upon us to preach the gospel so they can be saved, we can divide them into various categories. From souls are saved after a brief spiritual warfare. And you see that when you are preaching, that you know you are preaching the gospel, everything is flowing, there is no resistance at all, the moment you mention Jesus Christ and you mention about sin, you mention about the need of repentance and we need to come to the Lord, it appears that the way is ready. And the message just goes straight into the heart of this individual. And with just one or two questions and one or two things to clear up, the fellow is ready to kneel down and pray with you and eventually that fellow is saved. But not everyone is like that. There are some people that already have some covenant with the devil. Covenant with occult, with occultic power. They have been initiated, they have been sold right into slavery with the devil, to the devil. And you want to win those souls to the Lord. But those people is going to take more than a brief exhortation 
It's going to take more than short preaching. It's going to take more than snapshot prayer. It's going to take more than just, uh, you know, receive the Lord as your personal Savior. It's going to take more than decide now and you become a child of God. It's going to take sweat and tears and conflict and fighting and spiritual battles. And so we understand that others can only be saved after a long, drawn, fierce, intense spiritual battle. Some, even after being saved, even after being saved, you still have to keep on God. You see, after you have rescued those souls, I mean some of these people that have been sold into bondage, into slavery, into satanic kind of cause before they were saved. Some of these people, the only way they can be kept is that you will be on God. Alert. With vigilance and readiness for warfare from time to time. Because the adversary will not give up very easily. Uh, the example of the children of Israel comes to mind. Do you remember? They've been there for such a long time. And Pharaoh and the people of Egypt had thought they had had, eh, they had, had these captives perpetually, forever. They will never get out. Eventually. Somebody was bold enough to appear before Pharaoh and said, Have a message from the Almighty. Let my people go. He said, What kind of message is this? All our slaves that are supposed to be doing all this work for us, we want them to be lazy. We are lazy. We are idle. And eventually, you know how the battle started. And he threw the rod down and became a serpent. You would have thought that will just break the camel's back and his barrel will just say, let the people go. He said, big deal. You think you have power. You magicians, tell him that we Egyptians are not behind in the supernatural. So yours now. I became serpents as well. That's battle. That's warfare. And then, but we thank God. One is greater than the other. And then the serpents of Aaron swallowed up all the serpents of the magicians and they lost their serpents and they lost their rods and they lost their incantation, they lost their uh, whatever enchantment they were doing. But then they would still not give up. And then eventually turn water into blood, who said, you see, if you are the only one that can do that, magicians, how about it now? We did it. And he said, I about uh, you know, another one came, frogs came, and all that came. Eventually, God did something. And he said, Magician, pull out your tricks and uh, get it done. They tried, they couldn't. They said, You know, Pharaoh, this one is the finger of God. But Israel was not free yet. The battle was still on. Eventually, God said unto Moses, He said, You know, Pharaoh, it's not going to let those people go until I do that final thing. I'm going to visit all the houses of the children of Egypt. And from the beast even to the a man and to the one on the throne, and the firstborn is going to die. And when that happened, the Egyptians said, You see, this land is spoiled completely. Let these people go. And eventually he said, Now you can go. They pray for me as you go. And they went. You would have thought, Now they are saved. They are redeemed. Praise the Lord. No more battle. No more problem. These people are saved and saved forever because Pharaoh has realized the might and the power of our God. After they were gone, then Pharaoh said, What's the matter with us? What did we see that we let all these people, millions of people, that could give us cheap labor? He said, Use a horseman and chariots, get up, but we'll not let go like that. You see the point? After the people are saved, after the people are redeemed, after the people have been forgiven and now their names are in the book of life and they are rejoicing, we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. We know that we belong to God. You see, they, they could be singing, now we are saved, now we are redeemed. And Pharaoh said, you, you think you are redeemed? You think you are saved? You think you are blessed? And they followed after them. And uh, these, these people did not know there would be any battle anymore. And so what happened is that they were blessed with sin. And he noticed resistance coming from behind. And he saw that these mountains were on this other side. And remember, these people did not know how to fight. All their prayer had been done by Aaron and Moses. All these miracles and supernatural, they were done by Aaron and Moses. And so all they did, now when they saw the resistance, they said, we're finished. 
Have you brought us to this place today? Are there not enough girls in Egypt that we could have this what we said at the beginning? Leave us alone. It's the picture of the new convert. You see, some of these new converts that have been in Paul, some of these new converts that have been in some religions before, and the powers of darkness that maybe enveloped them, saturated them before they were born again, I was spiritual warfare and battling and praying and fasting and preaching. Eventually they came to the kingdom of God. But eventually now, even after they are saved, Pharaoh will not let them just go like that. And then, thank God, Moses was still there. You see, that is something. There are some people that say they are born again. After they are born again, they don't join any church. They say, thank God I'm born again now. And since I am born again, I will become a radio Christian. And every Sunday, instead of going to that deeper life church downtown, or going to that other gospel church downtown, they say, I have my radio preacher. Well, when Pharaoh comes, they are going to call your radio preacher and it's going to stretch his rod and the red sea is going to be divided. Right? Is that possible? All these television Christians, you know, I have my, my favorite preacher is on television. You wait until Pharaoh comes. You better get yourself in a local church as a newcomer because Pharaoh is going to come. The devil is going to try again. All these evil powers are not just going to leave that soul free like that. But when Pharaoh comes, thank God there can be a Moses, the Moses that God sent originally. And trying to read it when you are still in the tribes, in the, in the positions of Egypt. Let my people go. And thank God he has not lost, lost his rod either. Moses is still there. And the rod is still there. The rod of authority, the rod of power is still there. And then Moses cried unto the Lord. You see these new converts when they come to the Lord, they don't know to fight yet. It's just like these new babies that are born. And these new babies may have infection, or they may have attack, or they may have pneumonia, or they may have jaundice, or they may have some, you know, compulsion, they may have whatever. When these children are born, I mean, the physical, those children don't know the way to hospital. They don't know the prescription. They don't know they are going to take care of themselves. That's why we have mother. That's why we have father. That's why we have the nurses. That's why we have the people that can take care of them. And these new comforts, when Pharaoh comes again, when Satan comes again, thank God there are people that can support them in prayer and keep on fighting the battle. The point is, after the people are saved, you can say, now they are born again, now they are saved, everything is alright, Pharaoh is going to try again. And eventually, uh, you know, uh, Moses was told, stretch the road. He stretched the road. And the sea parted both ways. And the children of Israel, they went over. And you will see, the enemy, when the enemy saw that they are gone like that, the enemy will be looking at them like this and say, oh, what is this? They are gone. I will never be able to catch them. But the enemy said, Esther, we may still catch them. The devil will not give up very easily and then run after them. And, and the Lord was looking at them, you know, in spiritual warfare. This is what we will discover. That when the Lord wants to make a public show and a final defeat of that um, spiritual kind of enemy, He will allow that enemy to keep on moving, keep on moving until it gets to the very middle of that red sea. And then eventually God told Moses, said Moses, these new converts that just came out of Egypt, because you know they've been there for generations, for 20 years, he said, tell them, these Egyptians that you see today, you'll see them no more. Stretch your own. And the water came back. Already before that time, Pharaoh knew that the God of Israel was fighting against them. That time they tried to go back, it was no, no, no more possible. And now, on the other side of the Red Sea, look at Miriam and look at all the women singing and rejoicing. Thank God, our battles are over. We are redeemed. And they sang about Pharaoh, they sang about the Red Sea. And if you didn't know enough of the Bible, you will think, now, let me concentrate on all these other new converts or all these other sinners to bring them to the kingdom of God. Because for those people now, they are saved, secured, will meet in heaven. And then Balak sent to Balaam and said, Balaam, have you heard of a group of people coming from Egypt? They would pick up the whole land. 
Therefore, whatever the amount of money you want, just uh, come and call the people for me. You see, spiritual warfare. You see that that thing did not end at the Red Sea, and it is true for some of the converts that you are trying to help. That is why some of us, our fellowship leaders, he says, I don't know what the matter with uh, Sister So and So. Because at the time she was to come to the Lord with labor, with preach, with prayer, with fasting. And the after she came to the Lord, we gave Bibles, we gave trust, we gave Jesus, we gave everything, we prayed. In fact, we were staying in our house to pray with her, to help her. And uh, after we did that, she had a particular miracle to break through and everybody in fact she was singing. And all the family singing with her, saying that this is a wonderful thing, that this new church you have discovered, we will never leave the place. And then, you know, Sister so and so is coming again saying that they have come, or they are, who are these people that... I don't think the salvation of this person is genuine. If the salvation is genuine, all that labor, everything that we did should have ended the problem. No, the salvation is genuine, but also there is a devil that doesn't want this person to get to heaven. And it is possible for that devil to be fighting. Uh, till the last five minutes, the person is going to go into heaven. And you better support that individual. You better stay with that individual. You better help that individual to fight in the spiritual battle. And uh, you will remember that apart from Balaam and Bela, and you see for Balaam, God sent his angels. Angels even there to fight in this battle we are talking about. To keep these children of Israel safe with a sword drawn. And then they ask for the angel. But Balaam will not see the angel. Eventually when he saw the angel, he said, What are you going to do? These people are blessed. You can't cause them. You see, we are blessed with the blessing of Abraham. We are saved and we are rescued. But the curse will still be trying to seek itself unto us. Except there are people that understand spiritual warfare. That by the grace of God, we shall overcome in Jesus' name. Then you would have thought the Egyptians and Pharaoh and Balaam and Balak that that is all. And here these people were moving on and, and uh, you know they heard that uh, the Amalekites were already wanting to be destroyed. The people on the rear side and uh, Joshua and the people were selected together to go and fight against the Amalekites. And uh, when he said go and fight against the Amalekites, you would have thought that now old Moses. Now Moses can rest. After all, he has trained all these other people. Joshua is well trained, and all these other people are well trained. And uh, Moses is now becoming aged and old, and Moses should be able to rest now. And see these young Joshua take up the battle. Uh, but you know what happened? While Joshua was fighting against the Amalekites, because you know whether Amalekites or the Egyptians or the Moabites, or the Midianites, or whatever they are, the devil says. The point is, the devil is going to gather together all the people and the host of demons is able to gather together to make sure that the people don't get to the land of promise. And isn't that where we're going, the land of promise? We just sang about it now in the courses, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. And when I finish, when I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. You know it's coming again. And I will take you unto myself, so that where I am, there ye may be also. You know, all those Amorites and the Jebusites and the Midianites and the Egyptians, they didn't want them to get to the promised land. And all these ones too, they don't want us to get to the promised land, but we are getting there. Our feet one day will touch the land of glory and a place of gold and then we will look back and we will say yes where is your sin and even Satan where is your power because we know because of the cross and because of the blood of Jesus Christ and because Jesus now is interceding for us on the right hand of God we know that one day you are getting there we are getting there in Jesus name but you know you would have thought that now Moses you go and rest old man you go and rest because Joshua is able to do it and Joshua, young and full of zeal and full of power, full of wisdom and full of strategy, he went and all his people, he arranged all his people. But they discovered something. Whenever old Moses put down his heavy hand, because the old man is getting old and tired, 
and he cannot leave the rod off again like he used to do when he was younger. Then Joshua will be defeated, and the Amalekites will be getting more power over them. And he could have died all like that in the wilderness without being able to get to the land of promise. So Aaron and all, they saw the city, they said, this battle, we're going to lose it except we support Moses. And so one sat here, the other one sat here, and they lifted up the rod of Moses, the rod of authority, and the rod of power. And I believe that Jesus Christ is lifting up that rod on your behalf. And even though you may be a young Joshua on the field in the northern states where you are, where you are coming from, and you say, uh, does Lagos know what I'm going through? Uh, well, the authority beyond Lagos knows what you are going through. In heaven, they know what you are going through. Jesus knows what you are going through. And He says, All power, all authority is given unto me. You will fight, you will not be defeated. You will defeat the enemy in Jesus' name. Well, learn something from what we are saying. You might have become converted, and then the devil is coming with these nasty dreams and terrible dreams, and even telling you point blank, you are not free. If you think yourself, you are deceiving yourself. If you think that I've left you, you are deceiving yourself. If you think there's one heaven somewhere you are going, if somebody told you you are saved, you are deceiving yourself. And then you wake up in the morning, you begin to cry. You say, I am not saved. You are saved. Who says you are not saved? You are born again. You are a child of God. The fact is that, you know, Satan does not want to leave you alone to just go free like that. And so Satan, bye bye, I'm going to heaven. He says, which heaven? The heaven that is not able to go, you want to get there, he will trouble you. He will try to torment you. He will bring confusion and conflict in your heart. He will bring this kind of dream and this kind of dream. He, will, he can even wear white garments in that dream and say, I am the prophet of the Lord and you have been predestined to hell. Fire is a lie. When you gave your life to Jesus Christ and said, Jesus, I'm going with you. I don't want devil again. I don't want sin again. I don't want evil again. But you know it is registered in heaven. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when you called on the name of the Lord, you were saved. But those of us who are adult believers, those of us who are preachers of the gospel, let us help the young people. Let's keep on lifting up the road. Let's keep on speaking the word of authority. Let's keep on assuring these people and fighting in the battle with them. Even when they cannot fight. But let's learn another lesson. You know, sometimes young Joshua may feel, I can fight on my own. And then he goes to the battle against the Amalekites. And he looks at all the Amalekites and he says all these people, this one is small. With all the experience I got from Moses, with all the experience I got because I was there in Egypt. When they threw down that rod and it became this, I've seen the power of God, I've seen the manifestation of the mighty power of God. I can never be destroyed, I can fight. And he was fighting, but it was Moses lifting up the rod. You know, sometimes uh, some of us uh, young warriors, uh, some of us young people, especially when you newly become house fellowship leader, you have these big titles and uh, you may even be tempted to go and preach, uh, you know, a kind of uh, card and write your name, say brother so and so, house, fellowship, leader, keep alive, Bible church. Big, big card. And uh, you know, when you think you are like that, you think you can do it all. Well, thank God we know you cannot do it all, that's why we give you an area leader, so that when you young Joshua, you are fighting and uh, you know you are getting tired, there's an area leader behind you that is saying, I'm lifting up the word of authority on your behalf. And you area leaders, you, I'm coming to you, you know, you area leaders who say, I led house fellowship, I succeeded there, I succeeded there, I did this, I did that, and now I have graduated. Well, we know a time will come, you'll meet somebody ahead of you, that's why we give you a zona leader that when, you know, things are going on with those Amalekites, the zona leader will be able to come around there, and then by the grace of God, victory will be ours. You know what? We need to walk together. Just show on the field, Moses on the mountain top, and all and Aaron on both sides, lifting up his hands, in unity we overcome. You see the point that Satan will not leave all these people alone, but he will be following after them, wanting to fight against them, so that they can be brought back into captivity or slavery again. That is why, after God has used you, 
to bring souls into the kingdom. You will not just leave them like that. You will keep on helping them, counseling them, encouraging them, praying with them, assisting them, and fighting if necessary on their behalf. Spiritual warfare demands eight things I want to tell you now. It demands number one, knowledge of Christ's victory on the cross. If you're going to fight this battle we're talking about, and you're going to win, you need to have the knowledge of the victory of Christ on the cross of Calvary. Number two, it needs great love for captive souls. If you're going to fight in this battle, remember, you might be the free person. Do you see that in uh, Egypt? All that time that Moses was going to Pharaoh, Pharaoh was not able to do anything against Moses. Never. Never. He threatened, but he never was able to do anything against Moses. One time he said, you will see my face no more. The day you see my face, you will, your life will go for you. But Pharaoh wasn't able to do anything against Moses. And then Moses will come back again and face him and said, Pharaoh, what is your life? The people you want to lead, so you as a leader, as a pastor, it may be that God has given you a special kind of protection, like Moses. That clearly, they never touched me. All these people that come for counseling, they talk about this kind of dream, and this kind of attack, and this kind of problem. It looks strange to you, because God has given you this special protection. You never feel anything like that. But if God has raised you up as a leader, over other people to help, you need to have great love for captive souls. Great love for captive souls that they will not say what's the matter with them, that they are having problems. What's the matter with them, that they are going through all these things they say they are going through. You must have great, great, great love for the captive souls. Number three, a deep great knowledge of the word of God. Adequate knowledge of the word of God. If you see the devil, you need to know what is written. He is said three times over, it is written, it is written again, it is written again. It is a written word, which you know, which you understand. And you know the, you know the authority of that word, the power of that word. And you can use that word like a sword. You can use that word like fire. You can use that word like hammer. And it can break rocks in pieces and pierce to the very marrow and the heart of men and even uh, chase away the devil. Number four is the infilling and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The infilling and the anointing of the Holy Spirit is not enough just to know that there is an experience called the baptism in the Holy Ghost. If you are going to really wait to war, against demonic powers, against evil, you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And a kind of baptism in the Holy Ghost that is real, that is spread. A kind of anointing that is so powerful and it shakes you to your very foundation. A kind of anointing that you know that you are just God and it gives you so much authority and boldness in feeling an anointing of the Holy Spirit. Number five, understanding of our authority and the right to use the name of Jesus. If you are going to be able to help people to win their spiritual battles, if you are going to be able to help people to rescue them from the hands and the clutches of Satan, if you are going to be able to help the believers that the enemies are running after them, the causes or whatever running after them, you will need to understand our authority and the right to use the name of Jesus. Number six, faith in God. Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that whatsoever he says he will have, he will have whatsoever he says. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever, ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive. If ye have ought against any, because if ye do not forgive neither with your Father, which is in heaven, forgive you your offenses or trespasses. We must have faith in God. You must be able to say, I know that this is the word of God, and I know it shall be so. You should be able to act in active, dynamic faith that will be able to say that word and never withdraw it, know that that word will be fulfilled. Number seven, perseverance in prayer. 
perseverance in prayer. If you are going to be able to help souls that are going through battle, spiritual warfare, and you are going to be able to engage in that spiritual warfare with them, you will need to persevere in prayer. You see, sometimes the devil will not just give up like that when, when you say the name of Jesus only once. And even when he seems to retreat, he might still want to attack again. And you must not say, well, but I prayed for you yesterday. I prayed for you the other time. I thought you were the person that testified the other time that everything is now all right. Let there be perseverance in prayer. Number eight, willingness to fight. The full victory is manifest. Keep on fighting and keep on standing. I haven't done all to stand. Stand therefore. Because you see, the devil is going to try to, you know, come back again and try that person again, test that person again, tease that person again, torture that person again, afflict that person again. They're willing to keep on fighting until the full victory is manifest. Well, what, when we say that these souls are in captivity, what kind of captivity are they in? My point one, souls in captivity. And point two, spiritual warfare. And three, deliverance of captives. We don't uh, intend to take long time on this, but we need to understand the kind of captivity that these souls find themselves. And they cannot deliver themselves and they need your help and they need my help. In Second Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Beginning from verse 3. But if our gospel be he that is to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them, which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, to shine on them. You see, that is how the devil holds some people in captivity. He will not allow them to see the truth. The truth is so clear to you, it's so plain to you, but the devil will not allow them to see till blind souls them. In Luke chapter 11, reading from verse 21. Luke 11, 21. When a strong man and keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. What that is telling you is that when a strong man watches over his palace, keeps his palace, locks up all the gates and he doesn't allow an intruder to come in all his goods are in the places where he has placed them without anybody coming to lift anything or steal anything away and Jesus was talking about the souls of men and is referring to Satan as this strong man that keeps all these souls in captivity and they are in his cage and nothing is disturbed and nothing is taken away verse 22 but when he's stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divided his spoils then in verse 26 then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself and the entire and dwell there and the last state of that man is worse than the first Jesus Christ was talking of the state of the Israelites and using that he was talking on the state of sinners and talking about the people that are held in captivity by the devil and by demonic forces that when these forces are holding them no matter what you say, no matter what you preach, no matter the literature you give them to read, if there is no spiritual battle, they just remain secured under the devil's hand. But one is stronger than he shall come upon him. Think about that for a moment. One is stronger than he. Remember, Satan is a spiritual entity. Remember that it's not just physical, it's not something you can see with your eyes a lot of times. But it's spiritual, and to be stronger than that spiritual being, you will need the Spirit of God yourself. What makes you stronger than He? The Spirit of God, the name of Jesus, the Word of God, the blood of Jesus, 
your authority in the name of Jesus, the kind of uniform that you put on. For example, let's say that you are uh, twin brothers and uh, you are the first and your second is, you know, is, is, I don't know the name you call it. He is in uniform. You are not in uniform because you are not a policeman and he is, uh, you know, your twin brother and uh, you are coming and he wasn't really specially on duty but he saw that you know the traffic was not well controlled and here comes this heavy truck and it says excuse me please and steps into the road and he does a sound like this and remember he's in uniform and uh, you know the that driver will just apply the brake with all his strength until smoke may even be coming out of the tire because of the swordiness of applying the brake and say so, uh, and my twin brother look at what he has done and then you see another truck come in and say, excuse me please, and you stay up on the road. Well, the following hour we may be going for your funeral ceremony. It is not just because you are twin brothers, you may think you know what he knows. You can do what he can do. Do you have the uniform of the name and the blood of Jesus Christ? We might have gone to the same college. We might have had the same education. We might even belong to the same human family and we may be of the same height in the physical and it may appear that we speak the same grammar and the same local language if you don't have uniform don't step on the road because that thing can crush somebody but when you have the uniform the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus Christ and you spoke with the Lord this morning and you felt the freshness of that blood of Jesus upon your soul the freshness of that authority that a believer has when you are going on the way and there is a demon possessed individual or there is a sick individual so excuse me please it doesn't, once the uniform is on you it doesn't take exercise once the uniform is on you you don't say well what am I going to do and speak in tongues for another one hour before you get on the road you just say excuse me please so the civilians you know the civilians I mean I mean the people that don't, don't have the authority and then they say just wait a minute and that uh, that person that is demon possessed on the side of the road you just say in the name of Jesus and out comes that thing and it will come out it will come out not because of your height or your language, but because of the authority you have. How many of us have authority this morning? Why don't you use that of all of you from the north or from <laughs> some of you from Lagos here? You just keep this authority and your uniform is neatly packed into your box and say, that's my uniform. Put it on and do something against the devil. So that all these people that are tormented by evil powers, by the grace of God in our thousands, we can deliver them in Jesus' name. But it says, you have to be stronger than he. When he is stronger than he, cometh upon him. When you have the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the word of God, the understanding of the word of God, you know the victory of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And you have the spirit of God that has filled you and anointed you. I believe you will be able to do it in Jesus' name. But it says, if these people that are delivered, if they become careless, and they allow themselves to be empty then the devil will come back the evil spirit will come back and when he sees the place is empty and there's nobody with authority around and there's no word of god in the heart he will go and get seven other spirits more wicked than himself and they will enter which means the devil does not easily give up even when somebody has been delivered, when somebody appears to be free, the devil will like to come and check up whether there is uh, accommodation there now. Uh, I don't know what happens in your state. You know, sometimes uh, uh, some of these uh, southerners will go to the north and then they will get land and they will build house. But they don't live there. And because they don't live there, they come back to the south. And they will say, I have house in the north and uh, they have not rented it to anybody and they, there is no gate man there and there is no good padlock to lock up that place uh, I don't know whether you have noticed before if they spends maybe one year in the south there before going to the north but when he gets there he finds a lot of tenants that he never knew where they came from have you seen something like that before? and he will say from where are you and they will say from where are you and uh, you know that room is occupied that place is occupied everywhere is occupied you know what i'm telling you if there is no gate man in that in that place if there's nobody with authority in that place i just say i'm a christian i'm a christian 
everything lies fallow no gitman no blood of jesus no word of god and there is no moses for the rod stretching it up standing right behind you there's nobody with authority that is saying if anybody will come while you're sleeping the gate man i mean the people of authority say no this is not your place i'm guarding this place i'm your watchman over this soul i'm your watchman over nobody like that you will just find that before one year you know this one will come in that one will come in and when eventually we go there and we say ah, this is our member this is a deeper life fellow and we say from where are you that same from within we say from where are you and then we begin to battle the battle we should have engaged in one year ago i'm telling you that the devil would like to keep these people in captivity and i pray that you will not allow the devil to do that don't allow him to do it to your children don't allow him to do it to your converts don't allow him to do it with people that god has made you a watchman over then we have in acts of the apostles chapter 8 verses 9 and 10 Acts chapter 8 verses 9 and 10 then there, but there was a certain man called Simon which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria giving out that himself was some great one you see there are these messengers or emissaries of the devil that will keep some people in captivity and bewitch them and you are trying to preach to them, but you cannot, uh, the word of God will not enter into them. Everything you say, this man will have an answer to contradict what you are trying to say. Because of the bewitching of the source of sorcerers and witchcraft and people with evil powers, that you just find out that they cannot concentrate and hear the word of God. That's why you need that kind of spiritual warfare to be able to deliver such people. Acts chapter 13 from verse 6. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was by Jesus, which was, was the deputy of the country, such as Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. He desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, who stood there, seeking to turn away the dead putty from the faith. Uh, it's sometimes you find out in some of our churches that somebody now, he comes from his house. And his house is infested with evil spirit. And there's a shrine there perhaps. And there's a particular secret call that the father, the mother, the brother, the sisters, all of them are involved in. And this fellow is interested. He wants to hear the word of God. He wants to give his life to the Lord. He wants to get saved. And so he comes to church or she comes to church. And our preachers preach great wonderful sermons. And after the preaching, this fellow goes back to that same house. And you are surprised before the fellow comes back the following week, everything that you preach that other time, everything is gone. You start preaching again. And you preach powerful, powerful message. And this fellow goes back again. All the other days that he spends in the house, everything is pushed away. And keeps on coming and keeps on coming. And then this person has already come now for one whole year. And you say, you tell this person, how can a person be born again? And the person will be smiling. And you know, just say, well, he will be born again. How will this person be born again? He will just be smiling. He says, ah, ah, you have been coming to this church for one whole year. Said the scripture, Bible study, revival time, and the real messages, and all these wonderful messages we are hearing. Then you just say, well, you are not serious about the fellow. Is, if the fellow is not serious, can he be coming every week for one whole year? Why don't you find out what is happening at home? Why don't you find out the sorcerer at home, the witchcraft at home, and all those things that everything that you may hear, there is this fellow in the house of the old family, bewitching that person, you can go, but you will never get anything out of it. And then know that it is not just preaching, that you need to come together in the power of the Holy Ghost and break that yoke, and that person is going to be born again. Look at this, in verse uh, 9. You see, he was seeking to turn the deputy away from the faith. It's not by argument, it is by the power of the witchcraft and sorcery. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. How I pray you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, 
If you are filled with the Holy Ghost, even Paul has been baptized in the Holy Ghost before this time, I mean, you are afresh. You are filled with the Holy Ghost again. And the power of the Holy Ghost just comes upon you to consume you all afresh. You will, the things that will happen with these people that have not been able to get saved after you have preached and preached and preached, you will be surprised yourself. It says, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. What does that mean? Now let me ask you a question. If you are preaching, or if you are witnessing to somebody, and you know very clearly that somebody is presence throws something like a cloud over you. His presence, if he says, excuse me, I'm coming, when he goes to maybe buy uh, something there, maybe granuts, or goes to buy spice, while he's away, you're able to speak with freedom. Everywhere is free. The air is clean. Everything looks all right. And you're able to preach very well to this person you are talking to. After he has brought, bought his granuts and spice, and he comes back, and he's uh, li- looking at you and listening to you, fear grips you. Sweat all over you and cloud and darkness and everything and you'll be repeating some things two times and you are not well coordinated and everything now if you want to challenge that individual how do you challenge him don't you know that you'll just drop your head you'll be timid you'll be fearful you'll be trying to avoid that individual because there is no power but when the holy ghost came upon paul he looked him in the face that's authority he wanted to do something he wanted to say something. He wanted the power of the Spirit of God to come in direct confrontation against the power of evil. And then he said, O oh, full of all subtlety and mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, will thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee. And thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Now I pray that days of miracle will come again. That all these sorcerers and witches and wizards and the people that are hindering those who need to be born again, that the hand of the Lord will deal with them. Not to kill them, just deal with them and let them know there is a power greater than the one they are carrying about. There is something greater than the one they have in the pocket or under their pillow. There is something, the name of Jesus, the power of the Holy Ghost that you have that is going to be released immediately you go back home. That that power is available today and there will be silence in Jesus' name. That's the result. Verse 12. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, he believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. You see, that is what will rescue those people, the people that are in captivity, the people that are held in bondage. It is a manifestation of the power of God that will rescue them. Let me quickly go on to spiritual warfare. I've said a lot of, about that in my introduction. Let me just uh, say this. Uh, before we go to the last point in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 and 4 but though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh well to start with if you are going to really do spiritual warfare stop thinking of yourself as I am only a little girl I am only a young man I'm only such and such. I'm only an ed- uneducated illiterate. I'm only a sad soul. I'm only a weak fellow. I'm only this. I'm only that. Let's stop all that. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. You're confronting the devil. You're fighting against the powers of darkness. It's not on the basis of your education or lack of education. It's not on the basis of whether you are tall or you are short. It's not on the basis of whether you are strong in the physical or you are um, weak in the physical. You know, I have uh, read of some people that uh, some of these people uh, normally and naturally they are so gentle and they are so weak, I mean physically. And they, they can't do anything of strength. If you were to, if they were to run, uh, maybe about just a hundred meters with 
any other person, like a young man or a young woman, they will not be able to run almost with anybody. But when it comes to authority and destroying the works of the devil, I've read of these people, they are so mighty. Why? Because they walk not after the flesh. That is, they were not doing the work or doing the work there because of being in the flesh. I read of a particular woman. That woman was mighty in the Lord. You see this woman before the woman knew the Lord, very weak in the physical. See, and even you know the children. And when you think about you know the whole thing as you read about the woman, you will see that in the natural she shouldn't have been able to have any authority at all. But God called her, and she was going to have a meeting somewhere. And some, I think, nine men. I mean, real troubleshooters, troublemakers. They ganged up together. And he said, we are going to stop that meeting. And we're going to destroy that meeting. And, uh, you know, they planned all the trouble they were going to make. And remember, this uh, woman that I'm talking about had no crusade director, had no choir, had no uh, prayer warriors, had no other people. In fact, all the people in that city, the majority of them, they didn't believe in women preaching. But this man said, God had called her. And you know, in her physical weakness, she went in the boldness of faith and prayed unto the Lord. When she got to that place she was going to uh, preach the gospel, everything looked cold, as if nothing will ever be done. And some religious Christian people, you know, they had uh, compassion on her, they told her, don't waste your time. Other people, men of real, of renowned ministry, they have come to this place and they were not able to do anything. And not to talk of a woman coming, and a woman of your own kind of disposition. And uh, these people are already, I, we don't know whether you have the information, and these are people we fear in this city, that once they say they are going to scatter a particular meeting, well, any wise preacher will just pack the tent and, you know, go back home. Because uh, you will know that these people, whenever they mean anything, whenever they say anything, they mean it and they do it. And the woman said, well, God sent me. I'm a woman, I'm weak, I don't have anything, but God sent me. And so she prayed and, you know, went for that meeting. And the people, the people came. It was a surprise. I mean, the people to hear the gospel. And then, the people that wanted to make trouble. And the first one came, immediately he stepped into that place where the woman was preaching. He fell down and stood there helplessly without being able to get up. And the other one came and they were all falling down like that, falling down like that. And the woman just kept on preaching the power of God. And then eventually after the whole thing, the woman made an altar call. And then as she made an altar call, these uh, gang leader rose up and came to kneel down. That other one came to kneel down. And they were saved, born again. And they became the people that helped her, going about in all that city saying, Come and see, this is a woman of God. This is a woman of God. If you will arise and do the work of God, I'm telling you that the devil shall not be able to stand before you in Jesus' name. But you see, you see our problem, our problem is that we think of who we are in the flesh, who we are in the natural, how we don't know book, how we are illiterate, how we don't know this, we don't know that. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not carnal. Not physical, not something that all these people can fight against, but mighty. Through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, I believe it is possible today. And it will be done. Then you will be able to deliver the souls in captivity able to deliver the souls in captivity just two references and then we'll pray in Luke chapter 4 chapter 4 Luke chapter 4 reading from verse 18 the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the broken hearted to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. But then the question is, because many of us will know this, 
we know that the Spirit of God is available. In fact, John the Baptist said as one standing in the knees here that is greater than I because he was before me. Whose shoes slashed and not able to unloose, he shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. We know that. We know that Peter said, The promise is unto you and to your children, to many that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. It is possible for the Spirit of God to be upon us. Because you know the problem we have, the problem is even after you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, when there is a particular need and a particular problem, you will say, I will demonstrate that part tomorrow. I demonstrate it another time. But this is the problem now. Yes, I'm not ready yet. But when tomorrow, next week, I'm going to do this. Look at verse 21. And it began to say unto them, this day. That's a secret. This day. Not tomorrow. Not, not next week. This day. This scripture fulfilled in your ears. And I believe that as we go, the Spirit of God upon us will be manifested and this scripture will be fulfilled through your life in Jesus' name. Then in Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. I'm looking there in verse 24 and verse 25. Isaiah 49. 24 and 25. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered, but thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered, for I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and will save thy children. Your own children, you have given your life to the Lord, and the devil is trying to keep your own children in captivity. I will deliver thy children. Thy children in the faith. Those that God has given you as converts. And yet the devil is trying to keep them down, hold them down. I will save thy children. And the children of your tribe. Those people that God has sent you to. And he has said, go and preach the gospel to them. And while you are preaching and doing the best as you can do. You see that the devil is trying to keep them in bondage and captivity. And you say, maybe there's no way here. Maybe I should go to another place. Maybe these people will never be saved. They will never be delivered. I will save thy children. But thus says the Lord. Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away. Those who are captives of terrible powers, occultic powers, even from this very day, it says those captives of those mighty powers will be delivered in Jesus' name. And the prey of the terrible, the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. Then the Lord said, For I will contend with him that contended with thee. As you go out, as you preach the gospel, as you pray, as you manifest the power of God, it is possible that some people may think they have enough dark power to challenge you. The Lord says, He will contend with those who contend with you. The magicians may come. And they may try to duplicate what God is making you to do. But leave that in the hands of God. God will contend with the people that contend against you. And then he says, I will save. Even through you, I will save your children. And those your converts and those members in your local church that God has made you a pastor, a leader, and overseer over. I believe that God will keep them secure till that final day in Jesus' name. But then, it is our own time to arise and to know that the power is in us. And that we ought to do what the Lord wants us to do. The word of God says, arise and shine. For thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Do you believe that? Let's rise up and talk to the Lord. And understand that ours is the victory. The power is available. It can be done. God can use you. God can use you, brother. God can use you, sister. It can be done. Spiritual warfare for the sake of souls. Spiritual warfare on behalf of souls.
the power is available in Christ. Authority is available in the name of Jesus. Be strong. Arise and do it. Walking according to the flesh, the weapons are mighty and strong. They can pull down the strongholds. They can pull down the strongholds and destroy all the ammunition that the devil is banking upon. Like you, oh Lord, where we live, 
Please make us like you In all you must do, Lord Please make us like you Everything we say or do, and I 
everywhere we go, help us not to live in holiness as way of life. Life of purity and love divine, and set the path to only doing your will in holiness as way of life. White as snow. Oh Lord, make us white as snow. Oh Lord, make us white as snow. Please, Lord, make us white as snow. White as snow. In Jesus' name, we pray. Father, we 